Good morning, everybody. I believe it's 9.15 on the dot. Okay, let's go. So here we are at the end of the week. I'm certainly looking forward to the weekend. Excuse me. Sorry? Ah, <laughs> exactly. Um, sorry about my clothes. I didn't pack everything I needed today, so I'm feeling a bit strange. Okay, <laughs> at least you can laugh at me. It's fine. Okay, so we're going to be optimizing sleep today. We'll have a look at your sleep sweet spot. I think that's pretty much key. Um, and what a little bit about sleep debt. We'll have a look at the two most common sleep disorders and some of the disruptors of sleep. And then the last thing will just be about trying to establish a healthy sleep routine. So what I often do when I um, assess people's sleep, it's very easy for us to just do that indirectly by asking them to wear a little wrist-worn device, which is an accelerometer, really, and it helps us look at sleep patterns. So many of the devices that are on the market at the moment indeed do that. And what we get is something like this called an actogram. So let me just familiarize you with this. This is a day. So this is a 12-hour period from midday to midday the next day. That's Thursday going into Friday, Friday waking up on Saturday, etc. Um, the blue bits are the sleep periods here. I'll explain a bit more about that now. The black here is the acceleration. So that's just based on the movement so that we can... Um, well, the software that uh, people design then has an algorithm which decides based on movement during the sleep period is the person most likely to be awake or asleep. And it does that for every 15-second um, epoch and then creates a little picture like this. Um, and then the yellow part is the light exposure that the person has. So this person here has pushed their little button and they've gone to bed and this is their sleep period on Thursday night and that's them waking up on Friday morning. What I want you to notice about this very beautiful week of sleep is that this person was ridiculously consistent. I mean, almost robotic. Um, and there are a lot of people who, who actually have patterns that look like that. And these are healthy patterns. Because remember that sleep is a habit. And so if you are doing the same thing at the same time every day in terms of falling asleep and waking up, the body learns to anticipate, oh yeah, this is about the time of day that he or she asks me to go to sleep or to wake up, and it becomes a lot easier for the body to, to respond to that. So we like to look at consistency in terms of bedtime and wake time, and usually that needs to be within a range of about an hour, and a half, hour to an hour and a half maximum between earliest and latest. Okay, so that's kind of the rule of thumb. And you'll also notice, of course, that the duration is nicely consistent as well, and we like to see that too. Um, so that we know that sleep need is being met on most days. Now, obviously, we all, we're not rob robots, and there will be something to do on the weekend very often, or a wedding to go to, or some special circumstance, or there might be some big work deadline that you need to get through during the week. And so, once a week, we, quite, we would be quite normal to expect an, an, an out-of-range night, and that's fine. I wouldn't count that as so much looking at the inconsistency. The problem is when it begins to look like that. That is very, very inconsistent sleep. And you can imagine that remembering that going to sleep and waking up, so that sleep aspect of your 24-hour day is very much part also of entraining your body clock. And so by providing the body clock with this kind of input, you're not doing it any favors in terms of trying to get it to establish a healthy sleep-wake pattern or 24-hour rhythm. So you can see here that this person's sleep is quite chaotic, um, hugely variable in terms of, um, of bedtimes and, and that. Um, yeah, so it's just it's quite scary. Um, the other thing that you can also just notice from this is that um, the activity during sleep here is um, not what we would really wish to be seeing. So not everybody flatlines when they're sleeping. That's completely... Um, and abnormal. In fact, even if we look at this person here, they have a relatively high degree of activity during their sleep. And you can see the lights coming on at these times over here, so obviously getting up to go to the bathroom as they do there too. And this is a big awakening period for them too. But this is more like what we would expect, mostly flat with a little bit of, of movement in between. You can see this person does do some good old passing out in the, near the beginning of their sleep usually. <laughs> 
um, but then it's quite disturbed um, further on. And it, essentially what an algorithm would do, it would determine um, how large those disturbances are and whether or not they qualify as waking a person enough for them to have had fragmented sleep. And then they will give you what's called sleep, a sleep efficiency index. So that's of the time that you were in bed trying to sleep, how much time were you actually asleep? So on average, our sleep efficiency should be above 85%. Most people are actually above, above 90 and into the 95s. Those are the people who sleep well. As soon as we have a um, sleep efficiency of lower than 85%, then we would be obviously largely suspicious of um, a sleep maintenance type insomnia. So you can see that this person, as erratic as they are, they actually have really good sleep on this night here with very, very few awakenings. This is not a great night, and there's a whole lot of um, awakenings happening over here, which is very disturbing. It's interesting, this kind of sleep pattern I notice a lot in the, um, in the um, I've measured, uh, I'm so sensitive how you say this, but I'll just tell it like it is. In some of my black South Africans living in the townships, I typically notice this kind of pattern, incredibly disturbed and incredibly erratic. And I don't know, um, this is what I'm trying to get from them, whether or not it's just the living ex um, circumstances and the fact that they are in such small um, sleeping spaces and often very crowded with a lot of activity going on and then often very early wake times on work days but then no um, need to get up on certain days because there's no work to go to. Right, so let's have a look at what, what it takes to get to your sweet spot. Well, that's actually quite difficult to do but rather I'm going to give you four things to look at to know how close you are because people say to me, but how do I know how much sleep I need? So I generally ask four questions. And the first one is, how long does it take you to fall asleep? Well, some people say, but that's ridiculous. I have no idea how long it takes me to fall asleep. And that's fine. That probably means your time to fall asleep is quite normal. Because believe me, if you are one of the people who crashes out when your head hits the pillow, you're happy to boast about that. And if you are the person who is clock watching for 30 minutes, 40 minutes, an hour, an hour and a quarter, you'll also be very aware of that. So. Anything between five and 20 minutes is considered to be normal. Um, if you're falling asleep within five minutes, or well, literally you're the person who goes lights out when the head hits the pillow, that's indicative of you actually having quite a lot of sleep debt. It should take a little bit of time for you to come down and to fall asleep. So generally, if you're falling asleep too quickly, that tells me that what you're doing on a habitual basis is not at your sleep sweet spot. For people who are, um, or um, usually taking longer, anywhere between sort of, there's a gray area between 20 and 30 minutes that's beginning to get a bit dubious, but certainly once you get over 30 minutes, then we would be more concerned that you might have sleep onset insomnia. <coughs> if you do something called catch up sleep on the weekends or on your spare days or off days, then I'm pretty sure that your um, sleep sweet spot is not being met. So catch up sleep would be, if during the week you go to bed at midnight and you wake up at six, and then on the weekends, because you don't have to wake up for work or on your off days, then you still have your midnight-ish bedtime, but you sleep until nine. So that's obviously catch-up sleep, and we see that a lot. And in fact, you can actually see that in this person here. They've got their two weekend, specifically this um, Saturday going into Sunday. That's a big catch-up sleep. Um, so we don't want to see that because once again, what that is also doing, it's, it's interfering with your body clock by interfering with your sleep break cycle by not giving a nice continuous um, um, duration of sleep as an input. Sorry. Um, what I do think is very important is that there are times when we have to have catch up sleep. Um, perhaps you've there's been a lot of stress in a, in a given week and you just haven't been able to get the sleep that you need and on that weekend the only way to reverse that is to do catch up sleep, that's obviously fine. Um, by the same token, um, if you're undergoing a sort of, uh, quite a, like a sort of lot of um, trauma or, or loss or you're not well, then you'll more than likely do catch up sleep as well. So as long as there's a very good reason for it, that's fine. But if you're just burning the myth, sort of the candle at both ends, so to speak, and then catching up on the weekend. That's a pretty dodgy habit. Excuse me, can I just ask, that catch-up sleep, you do it, say, in the afternoon? Napping. 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 Yeah. Yeah. Right. Oh, that's a big, big um, hornet's nest. So I'll just quickly dive 
um, divert and ch um, chat about napping. So in an ideal world, we should be doing one consolidated nocturnal sleep. There is quite a lot of, I mentioned this earlier, um, yesterday, quite a lot of um, interest in polyphasic sleeping at the moment, which means that you have more than one um, sleep um, period throughout a 24-hour period. There isn't yet any evidence to show that that's good. In fact, from a circadian perspective, it can't be good because you're sending an incredibly confusing message to your body clock. Um, if you are doing napping in the daytime, it means that what you're doing at night is insufficient. For people who are young mothers who are breastfeeding, for people who are not well, um, people who are grieving, for example, then yes, there's a time and a place to nap, and athletes actually often have to nap because their sleep need is so massive that they can't possibly get it in in a normal nighttime period. In those cases, I've got no problem with napping on a regular basis. But if you um, are otherwise healthy, um, then I would be concerned that what you're doing at night, you need to get that right first, and then you can look at napping. Um, there's nothing wrong with that Sunday afternoon nap on the couch as a once-off thing, even like a once-a-week thing. That's fine. That's just that's you catching up from life, and that's you chilling and whatever. That's absolutely fine. But if you're finding that you need to nap on on an, a daily basis, or even three to five times a week, that's too much. Yep. I've been told or read uh, on medical sources that if you have an older age nap in the afternoon, it doesn't do much harm or any harm if it's less than 50 minutes. Is there any, any mm. veracity in that? So what you're referring to is like what is traditionally known as, as a power nap. So it's generally um, just a very quick shutdown um, just to try to revive again so that you are cognitively on the ball again. Um, so again, if you're, if you're needing to power nap, then it tells me that, well, I mean, I, there, there can be a lot of things wrong. You can be under a hell of a lot of stress and it could be quite useful because then you can be more productive throughout the day and it shouldn't interfere with your nighttime sleep but it would still make me wonder about what's happening at night that you are needing to power nap in the daytime. So I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm just saying you need to just look at the big picture and ask why is it necessary. Yeah, I mean, my mom is a, I mean, she's a practicing psychologist. She's in her 70s and she's still going and she often power naps between clients. But I think, well, she's got a hell of a busy life. She's practicing still, and if it's going to give her that little bit of extra zip between patients, fine. So she always pokes me and says, yeah, I'm napping, because I'm not, not a proponent of napping. But she, she needs it, and it works for her, and it doesn't seem to do too much harm to her nighttime sleep. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. And I think also as you age, it's quite different, because your sleep is much, much worse, and you can, you can work as hard as you want to getting the right duration and making everything right. But unfortunately, the biology is just against you. And so very often your sleep is just unrefreshing as you age. And so then napping does become slightly more helpful. Cool. Did I answer your question? Sorry. <laughs> Having a shocker. OK. Um, I mentioned this before too, is that the purpose for sleeping is so that we are literally on our A game during the daytime. and bar the first sort of five to ten minutes in the morning where we're all a bit foggy because we're changing state, you should pretty much feel refreshed. So maybe you do need that cup of coffee to kickstart you and that's probably fine. But within sort of 30 minutes of waking up, you should be able to look back and say, yep, I'm full of pep and I'm ready to go. And if you're feeling sluggish throughout the morning and you're just desperately wishing to get back to bed, then that's obviously a sign that your sleep was not refreshing either. I mean, that's really the purpose of the sleep is to um, restore and revitalize. And then you also need to look at your daytime alertness. So we should be on our A game throughout the day. We should be absolutely fine regardless of if it's the morning or the afternoon. But if you are really battling and people who have very fragmented sleep or insomnia or obstructive sleep apnea, for example, they will just have chronic um, sleepiness during the daytime and the alertness and ability to remember things is very, very poor. And that's a huge sign that you're well under your sleep sweet spot. So being at your sleep sweet spot isn't just about getting the, um, the duration right. That's absolutely one of the first things that we, you need to play with to make sure that you're, I call it your sleep opportunity. 
So it's that time that you shut down and you're in bed and you're allowing yourself the chance to sleep. Whether or not you can do it is a different question. But that's key. The other thing that you need to think about is the timing. And this is really important to understand if you're an owl or a lark or somewhere in between. And where possible, and I understand that there's a lot of circumstances, family commitments and um, work, for example, that might get in the way here, where possible you need to try and establish a sleep routine that is in sync of your, with your body clock. So I recently had a client, a new-ish mom, who is, an is quite an extreme night owl, and, um, but with the responsibilities of the kids and getting ready for work every day, she was having to be up very, very early. You know, that little, um, especially toddlers, love to wake up at anywhere between 4.30 and 6 in the morning. Seeing to them, knowing that her husband had to get off to work, so his sleep had to be protected. And um, she was trying to go back to work, but she was just exhausted because she couldn't fall asleep in the evenings and she was up early for this little kid in the, um, for her kids in the morning. And it was a matter, literally, of her going to her family, specifically to her husband, and saying, listen, I'm sleeping against my clock here. I, des I, I desperately need help in the mornings. I can't be up at 4.30 because I can't function for the rest of the day. And so they came to an agreement that he would actually take that morning shift for her, which allowed her to sleep in till 7, 7.30, which for an owl made a massive difference because she couldn't get her bedtime any earlier. So that was a bit of a uh, compromise that they had to come to. But the point is, is that she then was at least, even if her sleep wasn't as long as it could have been, it was at least in the right zone for her body clock. So that's really critical. Not everybody has the luxury of being able to barter and negotiate like that, but I, but I think that if you can, it's a very good idea. And then, of course, the quality is critical. Um, without good quality sleep, you might as well practically not be sleeping. And the quality is important because what we're looking for is undisrupted sleep that allows you enough time in that slow wave sleep phase and enough time in your REM sleep. So poor quality sleep, which is fragmented, will usually sacrifice um, um, slow wave sleep, and then you'll see that REM sleep begins to shorten as well. So we need to get all of those things right. And if we don't, so this is our sleep need or our sleep sweet spot, this is maybe what we actually do, the sleep actualization, and the little bit left over, of course, would be our sleep debt. So, as I've mentioned, sleep debt can come, come by from either insufficient sleep or poor quality or fragmented sleep. And a little bit sleep of sleep debt is quite normal. So I mentioned that we didn't have to pay back all of our sleep debt. And in fact, it's useful to have a little bit of sleep debt because it helps often with being able to fall asleep at the end of the day. So that's why I mentioned that it shouldn't be taking you, um, it should be taking you about 5 to 10, 15, 20 minutes or so to fall asleep. It's certainly not shorter, but a little bit of sleep debt just helps push you into sleep because what it's doing is it's, it's making sure there's enough buildup of that sleep pressure. So do you remember I spoke about sleep homeostasis? So that it makes sure that there's some sleep pressure at the end of the day, which makes it easier to fall asleep. But you do need to pay back a portion of that debt and too much sleep debt has the dire health consequences that we've been through in the last couple of days. So I wanna chat about two of the most common sleep disorders. So these are two things that are primarily responsible for fragmenting sleep. So um, sleep apnea um, is when a person literally doesn't um, have air passing through to the lungs while they are asleep for short periods of time. There's two forms, there's central sleep apnea and obstructive. So central sleep apnea is where the drive from the brain is, for some reason, um, limiting um, the air that is pulled in through the, through the um, lungs, and that's either that the diaphragm or the brain or the re related neural pathways are involved in, in not allowing breath to be drawn. More common, however, is obstructive sleep apnea, and that's when the upper airways collapse, and so there can be obstruction or a partial closure anywhere from the um, from the sinuses through to the bottom of the of the, the back of the throat. Generally, um, most people actually experience a little bit of both throughout a night, and that's called mixed sleep apnea. Um, but they'll be treated quite differently. Um, I won't go into the details of that. So, about it's actually a very common disease. Ten to twenty percent of people actually have moderate to severe sleep apnea. And it's massively underdiagnosed. I mean, I can't believe the number of people that we, that we see that have sleep apnea that actually had no idea. And um, the consequences are diverse, 
but primarily we're hugely worried about the um, cardiovascular um, consequences. And then, of course, long-term cognitive impairment generally comes from the build-up of lack of sleep over time and the reduction in REM sleep. So it manifests really as a chronic sleep disturbance. So at least a third of your night can be literally thrown away, resulting in daytime sleepiness and fatigue and reduced functionality and quality of life. So I just want to actually read you a passage. I hope you don't mind, but it's from the William Dement book and just the way that he describes sleep apnea. It's, kind of, it's quite amusing, but it's really good. So he says here, in a stunning evolutionary failure, nature endowed us with throats that tend to collapse during sleep and stop airflow, but did not endow our sleeping brains with the ability to start breathing again calmly. That's the key. At this breathless moment, the immediate future hold only two options, death or waking up to breathe. In the worst case, no air enters the lungs for 40, 50, 60 seconds or longer. The muscles of the diaphragm struggle harder and harder against the blocked throat without success. Carbon dioxide builds up in the bloodstream and the level of life-giving oxygen falls precipitously. After a minute or more, the brain is panicking, suffocating, screaming out for oxygen. Very dramatic. The skin and lips turn blue, and just when death seems imminent, the sleeper suddenly struggles awake, the tongue, throat, muscles tighten, allowing oxygen to flood into the lungs in a series of gasping, snorting breaths. Oxygen is restored to the blood, and the fatal course is reversed. Instead of being alarmed and staying awake, the victim is immediately asleep again, and after a few seconds, snoring begins, and the cycle starts again, repeating hundreds and hundreds of times a night. Sleep apnea patients remember nothing. So it's a little bit amusing, but it really does capture exactly what happens during apnea. And um, nine times out of ten, in fact, nine and a half times out of ten, it's the partner that observes the apneas and that says to the um, patient, you absolutely need to go and see someone. Do you know you're not breathing when you sleep? They have no idea. So some of the first symptoms that happen would be just very noisy um, snoring, and then um, what you would notice is the person would just stop, they'd take a breath and then they would just stop. An apnea is to, uh, to be defined as an apneic event, it has to last for 10 seconds or more. We all have a couple of bits of no breathing during the night. But as soon as it goes over 10 seconds, that's the defi definition of an apneic event. And as you can see, it can last for up to a minute and you can have hundreds of those um, throughout the night. So the, the concerns, of course, are the continual desaturation throughout the night. So the um, lower levels of oxygen, as well as the constant awakening through um, spurts of adrenaline. So there's just basically that whole parasympathetic, sympathetic balance is out of whack. There's far too much sympathetic drive, and the heart and the, well, the rest of the cardiovascular system doesn't get the rest that it needs. It does. It does indeed. In fact, any um, central nervous system depressant can have an effect on apnea. So... Um, Alcohol does through the relaxing effect, as do um, some of the other depressants. And in fact, prior to surgery, there's a questionnaire that is used here called the Stop Bang to look at risk for apnea, because otherwise, when you, if you've intubated, for example, and you now need to remove the, the tube, the person could have gone into an apneic state, and then their airways will collapse, and you won't be able to sort them out. So. This is the questionnaire that you, that you look at. You're looking for, S stands for snoring. Do you snore loudly enough for, to be heard through closed doors or to be poked awake at night? If you're excessively tired, fatigued, sleepy in the daytime, that's a risk factor. Has anyone observed you stop breathing or choking or gasping? That's a big one. Um, we always look at people who are currently being treated for or who have high blood pressure as being high risk. If your body mass index is more than 35, sorry, that should be kilograms per meter squared. Um, that's a risk factor. Age older than 50. Neck circumference is quite a big indicator because it's an indicator of the fat around the neck. So of course when you're lying down that's the extra weight and it also we worry about the obesity because of the fat around the tongue. So if your neck circumference as a male is greater than 43 or female greater than 41 then we'd be concerned and if you are a male those are the, the risk factors. So two, um, not to two of those you're at um, low risk um, three or four of those factors, you'd be at intermediate risk, and four or more, you would be at high risk. So um, sleeping medication is another one that can hugely exacerbate uh, risk for obstructive sleep apnea if you're a high-risk candidate. Sorry, does sleep apnea always be accompanied by, uh, with snoring? Or can you have it without snoring? It's 
very, very unlikely not to have snoring. So you can have snoring without apnea, but it doesn't usually go the other way around. Because usually, um, if it's obstructive sleep apnea, which is what I described earlier, um, there's usually a lot of resistance in the upper airways. And um, often it can even just be in the sinuses. And that is um, where you will get the snoring from. Hmm. I'm not an expert on that, so I would hate to comment, but I'm not sure. My understanding with cot desk de deaths is that there's, there's so many di different causes, so I'm not sure. But what I do know is that babies and kids can have apnea, which is quite severe to be having that from such a young age, because it is usually a disease that worse, the risk worsens with age. And the reasons for that would usually be associated with weight gain and with um, detraining of the muscles, so less muscle tone. And then the other thing with aging is that we usually then have, um, uh, I'm trying to think of what the word is now. Oh, sorry, I'm having a shocker. Um, <laughs> I'm so tired. Yeah, no, I have no idea. <laughs> So I'm not sure about that. Um, I mean, I, I, I suppose it could. But my understanding with apnea is not, not very many people die during the night because they stop breathing. Because there's usually that spike of adrenaline which starts the breathing again. But it could be way off. Right. Let's have a look at insomnia. So again, this is from Dement. And he says, there's so many different types of insomnia attributable to so many different causes that it's nearly impossible to make generalizations that will describe all cases of insomnia in a meaningful way. So really, it's just a massive blanket term to cover the fact that you can't sleep. Importantly, it's not really viewed as a, symptom, as a disorder or a disease, although it's classified as a sleep disorder, but rather it's a symptom. And I think that's key to understanding insomnia. You, it's not just like, oh, I'm an insomniac. I have insomnia. Well, yeah, you present with insomnia-type symptoms, and we, now we need to get to the base of that. We can't just treat the insomnia. We have to find out what's causing it in order to alleviate it. So it's typically characterized by one of three things. Either people struggle to fall asleep, they struggle to stay asleep, or they can't sleep as long as desired. So they'd have those early wake-up times at 4 in the morning, for example, and then not be able to go back to sleep again. And the key is to identify and treat the cause. So. Of course, like most things, you don't just have it or you don't, but rather um, there's a bit of an, uh, a spectrum. And indeed, every single living human being experiences insomnia at some point in time. Um, if it's a very occasional and you're only awake, say, for about an hour before you fall asleep or a little bit during the night, um, with no trouble the following night, then it would be mild. And we all experience that on a semi-regular um, um, basis. More severe, however, would be when you have trouble with it routinely on, on a practically every single night. And the question is really, to what extent does it bother you? Because if it doesn't bother you, don't fix what not, what's not broken. Um, but when should you be concerned? When you have difficulty sleeping for more than a few consecutive nights, that's a red flag, especially if there's no obvious cause and if your daytime function, mood, or performance is negatively um, impacted. So it's not strictly speaking correct to classify insomnia as transient and, and persistent, but it just helps us understand the different types and causes. So transient insomnia would be the thing that we mostly experience, and it's a temporary disturbance of sleep. It's usually one night, um, and it can last for, maybe for, um, for, for a week or so, but it's usually intermittent. When I say for a couple of weeks, I don't mean every night for a couple of weeks, because that is now becoming persistent. Um, what I mean is that you experience it once off or a couple of weeks in a, any given year. The typical causes, this is huge, is hyperarousal. So that's usually due to stress or worry. And I'm quite sure that almost everybody in this room would have experienced at least one night of that ty type of sleep where you either can't fall asleep or can't stay asleep because of that racing mind. Time zone change, so jet lag, is um, a big cause of insomnia for obvious reasons. Um, as is um, shift changes for, for um, shift workers. 
and then your sleep environment. So we've had a couple of excessively hot nights recently, and I don't know about your house, but mine has been plagued with mosquitoes, and um, there is nothing worse than heat plus a mosquito um, for ruining one's sleep. And certainly that's happened like, in the last couple of nights for me. So the resolution of transient insomnia is usually a spontaneous, and one doesn't usually pay too much attention to it. It's rather the persistent side that we're more concerned with. Mm -hmm. This will then occur normally frequently, nearly every night, and it's been ongoing for, many, for much more than just a couple of weeks. So people will often look back and they'll tell me, oh, but I've had this for years, and I can't remember when it started, but it feels like it was 10 or 15 years ago. It can be due to a circadian problem. So delayed sleep phase syndrome, which we spoke about, is one of the major ones because of this um, hugely shifted circadian rhythm and an inability to go to sleep at a reasonable time. The same, of course, for um, advanced sleep phase disorder, which will then um, often manifest as early awakenings. There can be biological problems like restless leg syndrome, gastroesophageal reflux or fibromyalgia, which can um, cause insomnia, or psychological problems, depression, phobias, anxieties, etc. Persistent insomnia is really, really difficult to deal with. Because of that it's, been, it's lasted for so long, um, people often can't tell you what the cause was anymore. And because we need to be able to treat the cause, that makes it really difficult to treat. Because now the cause may well be gone, and you've now got a habit that now needs to be literally broken. So what typically happens, um, if a person, let's say somebody loses, I don't know, a spouse, something awful, um, they may well experience um, temporary insomnia because of the grief, um, and they very often actually prescribe sleeping medication just to try to get some rest in that period. But um, if that time goes by, they might come off the sleeping medication, but things are different, and maybe they are much more anxious than before, and now suddenly sleep doesn't come as easy as it did, and then it just becomes a habit, and then years down the line, this person's still battling with insomnia. Going back and dealing with the grief as a way of trying to sort out the insomnia is, for obvious reasons, not going to work. And so typically then what we would do is something called cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia, which is an approach designed um, by psychologists to, um, to make specific changes in behavior to try to break the old habit and establish a new habit of sleep patterns. Um, it's quite intense and it does take quite a lot of time, but it's currently the most effective way of dealing with insomnia where the cause isn't clear. Okay, so what are the kinds of things that disrupt our sleep? Oh, I don't know about you, but sometimes I feel like I'm being pulled in 10 million different directions. There's so many things that we need to balance in any given day, and the short of it is that we only have 24 hours in a day. And so, as I said, when we don't, have, don't, don't feel that we have enough time to get everything done in a day, it's very easy to steal from our sleep time. And so essentially, whether it's work-related stress or student stress or some other um, aspect of your stress, one of the um, most common um, outcomes is, is that we may develop insomnia. And I think it's really um, worth just stepping back and taking a look and trying to understand if that's the key cause of your, of your insomnia, something that, that is happening at work or with school stress. So those are actually things you can deal with, maybe, maybe not very easily, and you may not want to deal with them, but there are these things that one can address. Very often people will use medication to try to deal with insomnia, and it's just worth remembering that if you use central nervous system depressants, and it can range from alcohol to sleepy medication to um, anti-anxiety medica anti medication, don't forget that over the time what you are doing is ultimately robbing yourself of REM sleep. So you'll remember this little hypnogram concept that I showed you earlier, with the different sleep stages, and typically a person who's using depressants does not have a lot of REM sleep, and we've, we now know what the dangers of that. And this is an old, sorry, it's an old graph, and we've now grouped three, stages three and four slow-wave sleep together, but what also typically happens is you begin to lose out on your slow-wave sleep as well. In terms of central nervous system um, stimulants, which a lot of people will use just to try to make, meet deadlines or um, be alert when they need to for writing exams or for any other reason, and these don't have to be um, sort of narcotics, I'm really speaking about over-the-counter and or even caffeine. 
um, what they do is they unfortunately break your sleep. So you'll have a lot more um, awakenings, a lot more fragmentation in your sleep than you would do if you weren't using them. And they also tend to take away from your sleep, your deep sleep, because they're busy fragmenting your sleep. Right. So I thought we could just chat very briefly about sleep through the, through the lifespan. And I quite like this little quote that on the whole newborns, I'm really speaking about that first month when they do not much else besides sleep, they make sleep look pretty darn easy. Toddlers find it daunting, and I think it's mostly that good old FOMO, fear of missing out concept for them. Teenagers seem to be convinced that they don't need it. Adults want it, but frequently don't have time for it. And seniors may well have time for it, but often can't achieve it. <laughs> so it's very elusive and it's very frustrating at times, but I think we all now value um, um, sleep and it would be uh, nice to be able to get it right. The sad thing is, is that as we age, there are changes that happen to the physiology of our sleep and there's really not much that we can do other than accept it, um, which is not very helpful. But anyway, have a look at this here. So this is age from 5 to 85 and this here is hours or minutes of sleep. And so you can see that, that youngsters, this is up to your 10 year olds, have a huge sleep need. So if any of you have children or grandchildren that are in that um, stage, they really should be sleeping, and I hope that some of yours are, 10 to 11 hours per night. I know I force my kids to, and they're like, Mom, why do you have to be a sleep doctor? You're so mean. Um, <laughs> and I'm like, it's just for your own good, my dear. Okay, so the, you can see they're doing a huge amount of slow wave sleep here, because obviously they're in, a, in, a height, in the height of their um, physical development. And this, um, after sort of the teen years, this tends to drop off a lot, as does the sleep need. And then it's relatively stable in terms of duration in your adult life, but what you'll notice very slowly starts to happen is that especially from the 50s here, we start to have quite a lot more lighter sleep. So our, our slow wave sleep tends to reduce um, because we tend to be in more of stage two. Um, our REM is relatively consistent, but we have more awakenings throughout the night. And then this really just continues as we age as well. Um, so relatively frustrating, I can appreciate, but there's not a whole lot that, that can be done about it at this point. And so unfortunately, what I tend to notice is that there's a huge amount of people using sleeping tablets in their, in their older age because they are frustrated at not being able to sleep how they used to sleep and not being, yeah, uh, which I can understand and I'm not going to make any comment on that. Because, um, yeah, I think you can only comment on it when you understand it and when you know it. So the other thing, yeah. So my view, <laughs> this is so controversial, my view is to use medication for what it's designed to be used for. So not to be using medication for its side effects as a bonus. That, that, that happens a lot. And it's generally down the line not a great idea. So it might be a bonus that some antidepressants do enhance sleep, although others don't. Some actually can make it quite a lot worse. Um, I wouldn't want to be using sleeping medication or antidepressants for that reason, to try to sort out sleep. I would rather try to understand what's wrong with my sleep and try to fix it. I realize that's not always possible. And I realize that there are a lot of um, psychiatric disorders that go hand in hand with sleep disorders and they're often very, very difficult to, to co-treat. I do get that. Yeah, but I'm not a fan. I do think, I do think these disease, that they, these can go both ways. Remember the chicken and egg argument that I had with sleep deprivation and circadian disruption. I think it's a very similar thing for um, psych psychiatric diseases and sleep. I haven't gone into that because it's not my area of expertise, but from what I've read, there's a lot of evidence to show that long-term sleep problems can exacerbate um, psychiatric disorders. I'm not going to say cause because I don't think that that's fair. And then often as a psychiatric condition develops, sleep then um, also worsens. So I think it's a two-way relationship, but I'm not sure that one causes the other. But I do know that, for example, with the neurological diseases like Parkinson's, is that chronic circadian disruption and sleep disruption seems to be one of the precursors 
for developing something like Parkinson's. So it, 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 it's understood to, to do so, but I think it depends on the type of medication, but the understanding is that it, is that it can by reducing the REM sleep. Yeah, so this, it's difficult because you're not gonna leave the depression untreated. You've gotta sort that out, absolutely. Yeah, so it has a relatively quick action, which is why it seems to be useful for tr treating jet lag. But if a person is trying to phase shift, so a person has um, delayed sleep phase disorder and they're using melatonin to try to um, phase advance their rhythm, it needs to be taken regularly. Because the minute you stop, you're gonna revert back to the old rhythm. So it doesn't change it on a permanent basis. Uh, is it correct or approximately correct that for every time zone R you move to the east or west, only turn and you need one day for your circadian clock to recover? Yeah. So the rule of thumb is that once you go over three time zones, so three time zones doesn't seem to be much of a big deal for us. As soon as you go over, it's approximately one day per, um, and this is if you're going east, by the way, one day per time zone to recover. If you're going west, we recover faster. It's more like three quarters of a day, plus or minus. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, so for people who are light sensitive, um, it's a really great way to help reduce um, any photic input because light can still come through your eyelids. My mom describes hers as being paper thin and so she says she's very sensitive and other people aren't. So if you are, then yes, it makes a difference. Yeah. So your sleep environment is important. So there's a whole world called sleep hygiene. I'll show you one last slide just now on sleep hygiene. And sleep hygiene is around getting some of the basics right to help to promote the best possible sleep opportunity. And it involves having a good, comfortable sleeping environment, um, not too hot, not too cold, dark enough if light is a problem for you, um, making sure that you don't have caffeine too late, all of these things. But to be honest, when I, so many people are so aware of good sleep hygiene these days that a lot of people are doing it automatically anyway. And they don't really need advice on it. It's once you have a proper sleep disorder like an, an insomnia, you can do hygiene until you blue in your face and you're not going to solve the insomnia. You can put a person who's got apnea onto the best possible mattress, play them all the soothing music in the world, but until you sort out what's happening in their head, it's not gonna help. So yes, you need a, very comfortable for you, sleep environment, and that could entail having a really good mattress, very good pillow, making sure there are no dust mites, which exacerbate allergies at night, etc. cetera. Um, but I don't think it's the primary thing. I think that, and often it seems like a luxury to be able to have access to all of these things as well. Um, some people swear by white noise. They say that they can't sleep without it and that it's changed their life. And so if you're a person who's, remember that when you go from sleep to wake, what's meant to happen is you're meant to block out um, external stimulation to be able to allow your brain to rest. And if you're a person who can't switch off and who's hearing everything, and I hear people say, well, I'm a light sleeper, every noise wakes me, then in some cases the white noise can be really useful as a distraction against that. Who said that? I can't see, oh there, sorry. I, okay, so white noise um, is just a sort of grainy sound. I can't explain it better than that. It sounds like, like a TV static. Yeah, so it's not supposed to provide you any kind of stimulation, but it's just a constant sound, which it could be, it could be, yeah, yeah. 
So I don't think there's any harm in experimenting with some of these things if you, can, if you find that they work for you, but they're going to, white noise is going to work for one in a thousand people. But that's fine, if you're that person who needs it, yeah, what a lovely, easy solution. That's great. My wife used to use earplugs when she could spend. Yeah, well, a lot of people... It's very simple, exactly, and a lot of people find it works really, really well for them. But it all depends on what your, what your issue is, because for some people, noise and light make no difference. It's what's happening in their head that's the problem. For other people, it's a temperature thing. For, other, I mean, for another person, it's, it's something else, so it's, it's an uncomfortable bed. It can absolutely be. So it's about just figuring out what it is for you, and there's no... So I don't think there's any harm in any of those things, if that makes sense. Okay, wait, so one, two, three. Okay. Uh, could you please explain to us what, what, in your opinion, is the effect of good quality exercise every day? Let's see. Sure. I think that um, moderate levels of exercise on a daily basis help to do two things, establish a stronger circadian rhythm, because we need to be active, and that's part of it. And then they also help um, reduce um, oxidative stress and inflammation, and ultimately help promote sleep as well. So I think that it's an absolute no-brainer to use exercise. However, um, extreme exertion can have the opposite effect and actually create insomnia through high levels of pain um, and, and extra disruption at night time. Yeah, you're welcome. If it doesn't, if it helps you sleep, and if it doesn't interfere with your sleep and you feel refreshed and you're full of energy the next day, it's fine. Yeah. So, I mean, that's, it's, it's so, it's so in, inter-individual. Yeah. I don't think that's a problem because what you'll probably find is it's a distraction to help you get to sleep and you probably tune it out. Ha, ha, ha. <laughs> okay, well, one would tune it out. <laughs> okay. You mentioned as we get older, our pineal gland is sort of deteriorating. So, what can we do to keep our pineal gland healthy? <laughs> How do we prevent aging? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> no, I mean, I, the, the only things that, I, I mean, I'm only, I'm only thinking with aging, anything that you, I mean, we can't prevent aging, it's completely natural, but anything that you can do to slow down the effects of oxidative stress would be key. Yeah. yeah. Oh, did you not put your hand up? Yes. <laughs> Okay, so the, she wants to know about sleep clinics. <laughs> okay. <laughs> thank you. Well, that's us, so thank you very much. <laughs> He's my PhD student. That's amazing. So, um, yeah, we... Uh, Constantia Berg has a sleep clinic. It's run by Dr. Ishad Ibrahim. He's here normally six months of the year. Um, there's also a sleep clinic at Vincent Pilotti, and there's also a sleep lab at, which is different to clinic, but there's a sleep lab at Christian Barnard. I, I know the southern suburbs better than I do the northern suburbs. But essentially, um, Ishad Ibrahim is a psychiatrist, so he's relatively well-versed in dealing with um, some sleep issues. Um, the, the Vincent Pilati and Christian Barnard and Constantia Berg will all do overnight sleep studies, which is where they do that polysomnography. Do you remember I showed you with that person with all the electrodes and that? Generally, generally people are there for sleep apnea assessments, um, but they can also look for other disorders. Um, we, like, where we are, we don't do overnight, we do at home um, assessments for sleep apnea. We do testing for narcolepsy um, and a couple of other things. Yeah, but there, there's quite a, quite a bit that's available. Yeah. So is there an impact on the influence of uh, genes, genetic makeup, on whether one develops something or not, inherited? 
Yeah, definitely. Because um, if you think about the fact that your circadian system is, is highly heredit hereditable, um, many of your of the the predispositions for sleep um, disorders is also hereditable. And I'm saying that carefully because it's a it's a predisposition. It doesn't mean like anything you're going to develop it, but it just means that you may be more likely. It might be easier to trigger it. Yeah. So that's classic sleep maintenance insomnia, where we have that, remember I said there's a natural break, a midpoint of your sleep, somewhere around one to three in the morning, and that's exactly, if you wake up then, and if you have an active mind, then uh, it's tickets, right? Often you'll feel your body temperature often actually goes up as well, and you'll feel the thoughts are racing, you may or may not have an adrenaline spike, but it's, once that kicks in, it's very, very difficult to break it. So. The, the, the first step would to be do, to do some sleep hygiene related tips and if that fails then it's cognitive behavioral therapy for insomnia. So the sleep hygiene related tips around something like that would be um, if you are prone to that kind of thing and I think you pretty much know if you are, one of the things that I try to do or well, that the hour before sleep is critical in terms of making sure that you'd it's you time and it's non-work and it's li limited light, but it's just a time to release, relax, let go. And then immediately after that, you would then do what I call a download. So if there are things that are worrying you or things you know you need to deal with tomorrow, you need to make certain calls, go to certain places, see certain people, whatever you know the things are that are like, Ugh, when you wake up, you're like, oh my God, I have to do all this. You literally download it. Just write it down. Keep a journal next to your bed. You can look at it and say, all right, I see you, I hear you, and I'll chat to you tomorrow. Um, it's not that easy, but it's a process that allows you to just get that information out, because it's going to come, for sure, and usually it comes in your REM sleep and you process it then, but unfortunately when you're awake, it's horrible. And then once you are awake, you have to make a decision. Sometimes it helps just to get up, get out of bed, get it, change rooms, it just helps bring your body temperature down um, as well, get some water, come back, and often I find changing positions seems to help as well. It just does a reset. <laughs> See if that helps. Um, if not, then you'd literally need to say, to say to yourself, right, I do have a busy mind. I've dealt with these things, but I can't. I know I'm not going to sleep now, but I'm in a warm, safe place, and I'm okay with that, and I'm going to rest. And that's hard to do, but it's quite effective, and very often once you have that conversation with yourself, this sounds really weird, you actually let go and you end up falling asleep anyway. If after a couple of weeks you're unable to control those things, then often it's just, there's much more of a personality part that's part of the story here with a very anxious, overactive mind. And then CBTI with a psychologist is a must. Very much so, yeah. So she was describing when a person's sleeping on or off or whatever, and then you wake up like, and you have quite a, again, it's quite a spike of adrenaline probably, and you're just quite anxious, and you've suddenly got quite a lot of sort of stress or worry, or have I explained that nicely here? Yeah. Um, it's very similar to, to the racing mind, but it's just happened to wake you up very suddenly. So you're obviously processing it in, a, in your REM sleep and then you woke up, unfortunately. Um, so again, that's stress related. I can't stress how much stress, oh, that's terrible, um, emphasize how much stress ruins sleep. It is one.